we are starting a monthly series here called TFIR Topic of the Month or T3M. The idea of the series is to take a pulse of the ecosystem of the industry and then bring together experts to deep dive into these topics. I sit down with C-level executives, analysts, engineers, and experts to explore these topics and then bring these discussions to you. Today we have with us Eddie Smith, Solutions Architect from Sios Technology. Eddie, it's great to have you on the show. Hi, thank you. Uh, Swap, it's uh, great to have, have uh, myself on here as well. Um, and yeah, really looking forward to speaking to you. What kind of trends are you seeing in context of cost cutting or companies becoming more cost efficient? Uh, so I think the big one is a lot of companies now are moving into the cloud space. Um, a huge amount of them now are trying to leverage the cost savings, the efficiencies, um, and the ability, you know, just to switch on or switch off as need, as need to be. Um, that saves costs, but you, you know, I am seeing some companies now they are looking at moving back on prem. Uh, one of the main reasons being is there are some hidden costs with cloud that they maybe just didn't appreciate. Uh, maybe they're, they're they're not quite as disciplined in switching things off when they should do. Um, maybe they've uh, you know refreshed their internal hardware to a point where they say, hey, you know, we don't need the cloud anymore. Whereas when the environment was incredibly tough. You know, someone coming up to them and saying, "Let's have a, a multi-million pound refresh of your five-year-old systems." It was just so much easier to go to the cloud. So I'd, I'd say that's probably the big one, and then the one that's always in there is the, uh, you know, the advancing uh, march of the software companies. Um, so, uh, you know, you're getting uh, virtualization has now been taken over by cloud, as I mentioned, but you're also getting a lot of software-defined stuff coming in as well. So networking being done at the software level, that can change cost efficiencies or certainly improve them. Um, a lot of the software at the storage and at the operating system level is, is uh, more complex and a lot more um, uh, cost efficient in terms of the way that it does various things. So, you know, I can think straight away at the top of my head, the storage layer, you've got things like deduplication, you've got compression, you've got compaction. Um, and all of those things can reduce your storage footprint um, whilst uh, also removing the amount of space you need in your DR site as well because also, you, you know, you need all of that in your DR site if you were to maintain a highly available solution. When we look at cost cutting or cost efficiency, there are a lot of things that you have to cut, but there are a lot of things, there are a lot of practices that actually make you cost um, efficient. Like for example, there's nothing worse than downtime, you know, because it's bad for the image of company as well, you know, and you also lose business. So there are a lot of practices that actually help with cost becoming cost efficient. So talk about the role of HA in making companies actually more cost efficient. HA is incredibly important for pretty much all the customers I deal with. Um, they're very um, likely to be in a sector where an outage is going to cause a huge problem for them in terms of uh, reputational loss. If they're a public facing company and something breaks, you see it uh, quicker than Facebook know probably if something like that goes down. Um, uh, public facing cloud solutions, if something happens there, that, that's um, obviously uh, reputational for them as well. Uh, and then in finance, uh, retail, if anything happens in those sectors, um, you've got monetary value associated with that loss as well. So while our systems are not able to trade or they're not able to, to sell stuff in shop, that impacts the business and, um, and their underlying um, uh, financial figures at the end of that quarter aren't going to be as good as they should be. Um, you've got industries like transportation, um, energy and utilities, healthcare, um, another big one is the healthcare system goes down. Some extremely important life-changing uh, technologies are used within healthcare. So an awful lot of these companies, um, these industry sectors are actually deploying HA solutions because they recognize that to deploy a HA solution, it minimizes the downtime, which is their most important thing that they want to minimize. Um, and it reduces complexity um, uh, than Getting a human in board and saying, "Hey, what's going on here? Let's get a let's get an engineer to say it. Sorry, it's going to take you eight hours for the guy to turn up and fix whatever went wrong with the hardware before we can switch those systems back on again." A HA solution will actually automate all that for you. It'll take all your systems, move them to a secure DR site in a second location away from where the problem occurred, 
and it will allow that HA system in its standby state to come up and continue to service the application or the services that you lost in the original site. Um, so most companies that I work with, uh, in fact, there's not many I've seen without it, have a HA solution in there somewhere. Um, and, and that's the way customers deal with it. Uh, since you touched upon some industries, I want to go a bit deeper into that uh, because you folks, you know, work in that area is that are there any specific industry sectors which are particularly concerned with cost and efficiency savings for uh, bare edge environments? Financial services, um, uh, you know, they, they do require high levels of availability, uh, you know, to avoid the downtime of potential losses, but they're also incredibly interested in saving costs as well. Um, at the moment, we're seeing quite a lot of layoffs in the financial industry. They're reducing headcount as their primary method to save costs. Um, and they're also relying on automation as well. And that's not just true for finance services. Um, a lot of customers are actually going down the automation route as well as the cloud route, but backed up with HA, highly available systems at the same time. And I, th I think that the thing to say is that all of these types of technologies are great. Uh, and they will save costs and they will save money because it does avoid those outages that cause financial loss to particularly people in the financial sector. Um, healthcare, it's always been there to be honest with you. Uh, they've always had some form of resiliency in there to protect it because they're critical. You know, if something goes down there in healthcare, then you know, people die. Um, in, in, in terms of cost efficiency, again, it's in staff, it's renewal of technology. Uh, it's been incredibly competitive with their vendors to say, hey, you know, we can't afford to pay either uh, for a refresh this year, so we're going to pay increased support costs, but overall, the environment actually costs them less. Um, and things like the pandemic and, you know, the, uh, the way that the, the, the global sort of economy at the moment is just looking is you know a lot of people are pressing as many places as they can to try and reduce those costs uh finance services being one that i can immediately see government uh, recently i know in the uk with lots of people out on strike at the moment because they all want pay rises and the government are not allowing them to have a pay rise or not as much as they want uh, so again it affects people individually when when these companies want to go down the route of saving costs um but they're, they're, they're the main ones I see at the moment. Since we are talking about cost efficiency, cost cutting, uh, and also HA, uh, can you also talk about, you know, when we look at HA solutions, how do they, in a way, you know, help in achieving, you did touch upon that, but I want to go just specifically in details of that as well, that how they actually help these companies, because they, these companies, as you said, they are very, very sensitive, so they do have all the practices when it comes to high availability. So let's talk about what do already have and how, uh, what they're doing so as to ensure that they don't compromise on high availability solutions, but they actually help in achieving cost efficiency and cost saving. So there's a broad number of categories here where they tend to achieve these savings. Um, some of them don't immediately show that they're going to save you costs, but they do. Um, so, so the easy ones that everyone does, monitoring and alerting. Um, it monitors all of their systems, it tells them when something's gone, gone wrong, it could be an email, it could be an SNMP trap, it could be as simple as someone just walking around a data centre and noticing an amber light on a, on a piece of hardware. Um, but they go through monitoring and alerting processes internally to try and get a bit of an idea. Um, some places are going to the level of doing proactive health um, fixes as well at the moment, so they can proactively use an artificial intelligence and environments like that to say, hey, we've seen this, it may not be an error and it may not cause an outage yet, but we've seen something here that we think if it does it three, four, five times, you've got a 50, 75% chance extra of the whole thing going down. So you can do proactive healthcare um, based on the, the output from your monitoring and alerting systems. Um, and sort of finding out when that problem's going to happen before it happens. Uh, the next one is capacity planning. So, uh, again, I mentioned the storage world. Uh, I've been to so many places where poor capacity planning has caused an outage. It's caused the system to go down. Uh, when all it would have taken is for someone to go look at that system and say, hey, let's, let's clear up some of the monster stuff there, stuff that we don't need anymore, stuff that's been there for years and nobody's touched. You know, let's get that off onto a backup system or let's just delete it, get rid of it or move it onto a lower tier of storage that's less expensive than the 
the one that's running their primary services. You know, if, if your production database goes down because some users are storing MP3 files on there, the, you know, your, your business manager isn't going to be very happy with you. So um, effective capacity planning is, is, a, is quite an important one as well. Um, so one that I've seen myself um, is companies ignoring maintenance and um, performing upgrades in a, in a timely manner. And this can be as simple as applying the latest hot fixes or patches onto your operating system or um, performing operating system upgrades. Um, you know, I think a, a big thing in the, in the world at the moment is cyber. So the lack of maintenance, the lack of upgrades uh, can expose you to potential security holes that could be, you know, take out your systems, cause reputational loss, have you having embarrassing questions with customers that you may not want to have, um, get legal people involved, uh, and all manner of things just because somebody couldn't proactively go in there and um, say, hey, you know, we need to upgrade the system this weekend, can you give me a couple of hours to do it? And uh, you close off those holes. And, and it's also just good practice as well. You know, keep your systems in top shape, um, follow the advice that the vendors give you, and um, you know, for the most part, you're going to get good support. Whereas if the first thing you do with the support person is say, I've not touched my system for five years, <laughs> they're going to say, well, hey, go, go apply the latest hot fixes and come back to us when you have, and if you still got a problem, we'll, we'll help you. Um, another thing that is one of the things that, that gets done in the background and nobody really appreciates is, is your backups. So these things just happen. You know, they go on, nobody sees them. Um, but when something goes wrong, they're the first first place you're going to go to. You're going to pick up the phone to your backup guy and go, oh, I've just lost my production database or a file I've been spending two weeks on that I've now lost because I've accidentally deleted it or it's got corrupted or something has happened. Please, Mr. Backup Man, can you help me? And it's great when you get that return back going, yeah, when do you want it? It's going to take me 15 minutes and uh, we can go back to last night. Uh, it's it's a worse case when you ring up and you say, oh, we've not done a backup for two years. Or, oh, yeah, we thought it was working, but actually it's not actually worked for six months, uh, but nobody noticed, which is where the, the whole thing around monitoring and alerting comes in. You know, you should pick up that stuff as it happens and go and fix it before you get to that stage. But backup and, um, and recovery techniques within an organisation are extremely good at trying to maintain uptime because they get you back to a certain place that you know in a, in a relatively short amount of time. But it still does take time. Uh, it's certainly not as good as a full-fledged HA solution where it's uh, pretty immediate when, when the failover occurs. Uh, so another way that customers and companies are actually reducing outages and increasing cost efficiencies is, is through uh, the use of redundant systems. Uh, so. Uh, you know, this ensures that critical systems can continue to operate even if one component fails. Um, in, in partnership with that, critical systems, as well as having multiple items that are redundant, they'll have a HA solution in there as well. So not only do you have protection from um, a component failure, you've got something looking at that piece of hardware and telling it to go and to fail over to a standby site because, you know, hey, this component's gone, it's going to cause a problem let's fail over to a different site and then allow the engineer to go in and fix or the, the software engineer to go in and fix whatever it was that went wrong with that particular component. Uh, and I keep mentioning hardware, but you, you can get software failures as well. So it isn't just pieces of um, equipment that go wrong, it could be software as well. Um, so we, we've mentioned it uh, briefly, but disaster recovery. So disaster recovery is where you pretty much lose your entire site. Um, that's the way that most people think about it. What happens if this data center just for some reason disappears? Where do we go from there and continue to operate? Um, a lot of companies operate a DR strategy where they say, okay, if we lose our main data center, we're going to switch over to the other one. And as part of that, we'll have a, a set of redundant systems over there that wouldn't be normally running in normal situations, but in the event of a DR scenario, we can bring them up um, an important component of that is making sure that the data is over there as well, because it's no good bringing up, you know, a, a bunch of systems in a, in a DR site if the data that they're attached to is out of date. 
So that's complemented usually by some form of data replication between the two sites. Um, and that can be provided at the host level, so using things like volume managers to do that for you. Or it could be done at the storage level, so the, the storage vendor, if, if you have one, um, can put their own technology in place. Uh, it's good for the storage vendor because they get to sell twice the storage, and it's good for the vendor because they get the licensing costs associated with it. But it's also you get the full support and you get the help and advice um, and professional services in some cases where you need help setting that up or actually implementing a DR plan in that worst case scenario where something does go wrong. Um, we have HA solutions that help with this as well. So we've got some HA solutions that actually have um, DR capabilities built into the product. So they will do not only the failure of the services from one site to another, but they'll also do under the covers, they'll do the, the data replication for you. So not only does the, the, the application or the database go across, but the, the data, uh, the last good update from the data, which could be literally as up to date as the primary, um, that can come up in the DR site as well. Um, the other one that I do see quite a lot of, again, in the cloud environments particularly, um, is, is load balancing. So you'll, you'll put your client in front of a load balancer, and your load balancer will have health probes in there that detect whether multiple systems, multiple web servers are actually operating and then direct the traffic in the most appropriate place. And they, they've got clever algorithms that can, that can detect which in my example, a web server, you know, which one's busy, which one's taking time to service the, the requests a little bit slower than the others and just not send data over that way um, because they know we're going to get a slow response. Or, you know, a health probe that will detect if an entire piece of hardware has failed behind the load balancer and actually switch it to something that still remains alive. And uh, that's, that's another way of, of doing a chain as well. So there's quite a lot of different technologies in there. Um, to try and keep things going but uh, as, as cost efficiently as you possibly can. What advice do you have for uh, companies or teams uh, where uh, what a step they should take to ensure you know a good balance between cost cutting, cost efficiency and all, also having a very you know well-defined disaster recovery and high availability? Whenever I go to see a customer and they say you know we want to achieve a DR solution or a HA solution um, or both, uh, but we don't want to spend a lot of money. It, it's a difficult conversation to have because you know straight away it's going to cost them more than it will do, uh, for the most part, than just having a single site with a single node. That if that goes down or the node goes down, you uh, are faced with, you know, in some cases, lifting and shifting that box in the back of wagon over to another site that has the network, it has the infrastructure, it has the connectivity to your clients. It's, it's a case where you say, look, it's, this is going to cost you. And it's just a matter of how much it's going to cost you. And uh, I touched on some of these earlier. You, you know, your data is usually the most important thing that you don't want to lose. So in the event of a, a data corruption, in the event of, you know, being uh, hit, hit by a malware virus, which encrypts your data, or uh, anything that affects your data, you, you want to protect your data as, as the foremost thing in, in because, okay, you may not have something to serve the data out, but you have it there. And it could be sensitive data as well. So you could have customer information in military, in governmental type departments. It could be sensitive uh, politically, or it could be uh, important from a, uh, depending upon which agency you're working for, you know, you don't want that sort of information getting out to anywhere else. So you want your data to be clear. So your first thing that I try to say is, look, put your data first and then we'll work out how to protect it. We'll work out how much that solution is going to cost you. Is it going to be your, your host-based thing, which is free generally? You know, you've got an R-Sync, you've got Robocopy. You know, they're free. You can put them on there, put a schedule in place, copy the data across at a regular interval. And, okay, you still need somewhere to copy it to, so you've still got to buy the storage. But you could complement that with some things like compression, which is free. Um, and uh, or you could go down the additional route of putting some expensive sand storage in there, um, getting a storage vendor, uh, putting in an expensive network that's dedicated just to storage, whether that's a fiber channel, fiber channel over Ethernet, um, or just just a regular um, iSCSI using your, a normal network. You could do that as well. But if you want guaranteed performance, you, you're going to need a dedicated network. 
and some people just don't have the money for that. But you do get the value of uh, getting all the vendor support and plus all the features and functionality that they'll tend to provide. As I mentioned, your compaction, compression, your DG, your snapshots, your, all the stuff that, that come along with it, but they all cost money. Uh, the next thing that I tend to look at is, okay, what, what do you want to do at the host level? You know, you've got this um, expensive 16-core, multiple gigabyte database that's running on, on this system here, and you want to take it over to your DR site or you want to make it highly available, but you don't have the, the funds. You don't have the, um, the, the means, the cost um, available to you in your budget that year to just go and mimic that in a DR site or even a second node added to the cluster. So this is where some people decide to go down the cloud route and they'll set up a DR environment or a highly available um, environment in the cloud, which it costs less. Um, there's no doubt about that as long as you only use it when you need it. Uh, you've still then got the problem where you still need to get the data there, but that can be done in, in, in different ways. And uh, the cost of just having the storage in the cloud is definitely not as much as having the storage and the computes in the cloud as well. Uh, and some people would go whole hog, they'll say, okay, we'll put both environments in the cloud and we'll only switch on the, the, the system when we need it. So, you know, my working hours are only nine to five. What's the point in having these systems running overnight when it's just costing this compute money in the, in the meantime? So that's another way that people can save cost is by you know, being very disciplined and switching off systems that they don't use when they do it, which is obviously really easy in a, in a cloud environment. You just click a button and say, turn it off. In a, in a real world environment with physical on-prem stuff, you, you've got to have people going around switching these things on and they want, may not come back again when you switch them back on because you've got moving parts in there like hard drives that fail after so long, uh, and particularly when you uh, when you switch them off and on again, they don't like it. Uh, so there's lots of different ways of achieving cost. And you, the, ca the cases I try to show to customers is, you know, what have other people done in your type of environment in a similar situation to you guys. Um, the unfortunate message is that it will cost you at some point to have this you know, duplicate environment that's there just in case something goes wrong with the old one. But you may not lose as much money because you're still able to generate business, you're still able to um, you know, bill your customers, you're still able to maintain your financial transactions to, to the external clients that you use. You, you know, so th there's definite benefits in that you don't lose that by having a standby system in place, but what it does mean is that it's going to cost you a little bit to, uh, to get there. And it's just a case of, you know, do you want a Rolls Royce or, or you know, do you want a Ford Escort? That's, uh, that's the difference between the two. In this case, of picking the one that suits you best for the cost that you can afford. Eddie, thank you so much for taking time out today and uh, talk about this topic today. And I would love to have you uh, on the show back again. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Thanks a lot.